Good morning. Welcome to First Wesleyan Church. Psalm 57 reads, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let's stand together and exalt the name of God. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us. are your church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and pride to see the captive's hearts released the hurt the sick, the poor at peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church, we pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, with this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church, we are the hope on earth. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. In this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land, set your church on fire. In this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us here this morning. You may be seated. Well, good morning to each of you. I'm glad that you're here. If you like babies and you like dedications, you've chosen the right service and the right Sunday in which to come because we are going to dedicate um, one little girl. So the Betcher family is coming. Many of you know Pastor Mark uh, serves on staff here at our church, but you may not know all of his family, but this is his lovely wife, Brooke, and they have Eden, who is the eldest daughter, and then they have Peter, and then this is Kara. And they have asked uh, that they could dedicate Kara, Faith, to the Lord. 
Now, today is her uh, six-month day. Here, let me move this back here. Some of you are having trouble seeing, and you want to see this beautiful family. Today, she's uh, six months old. She was born July 30. I was born in July, so it's a great month, uh, yes, to be born in. And so, way to make it. Good job. We trust that uh, she'll get along with me here this morning. I won't hold her to the, to the prayer time, but Mark and Brooke, this is important. You've done this with your other two kids, and this is important because she is a child of yours, and we trust in future days she'll be a child of God. You have a huge responsibility. I know you're around the church a lot, but you have to teach her about the Lord still, and that's your aim. I understand that, but uh, what, what a great thing. And, and church, this is a responsibility of yours as well. Uh, Car is not walking yet. I understand she's kind of sitting up by herself a little bit right now. Sometimes uh, she might plop over. Uh, all of you used to do that too, just so you know. Uh, some of you still do. <laughs> well, so uh, back to this. Uh, anyway, um, she's going to grow and she's going to be seeing some of your kneecaps and, and she's going to be looking up at you and saying, who is that person? And so not only is this a dedication of Cara, but it's a dedication of you two and it's a dedication of our entire church. And uh, it's, it's funny to think about, someday she's going to be driving. <laughs> someday maybe uh, you'll be in the audience and She'll be with uh, her husband and having a child as well, or she'll be dedicated. And your responsibility now is to raise her in the way of the Lord, and I believe that you will. So let me grab Miss Cara here. Come here. This is Miss Cara. If you haven't met Cara yet, Cara Faith, wave it, everyone. <laughs> Would you please join me in praying for this young little girl? God, I just come before you, and I thank you for the life of Kara. You have brought Mark and Brooke together, and they already have two uh, lovely little children, and they're aiming to raise these two in the way of the Lord, and they want to raise Kara as well. I just pray, God, that you would help Mark be the best, uh, best daddy he can be. Give him the strength and the encouragement, the love and the discernment. Help Brooke as she stays at home with these three little ones. Help her to be the best mom that she can be for all three of them individually, but also together. And then, God, we just pray for Kara today. We pray that she would grow to know and love and honor and serve you. I pray in an early age that she would know you as Savior and Lord, and that you would watch over her all the days of her life, and may she serve you wholeheartedly. God, we thank you for this life, and thank you for bringing her into our world just the right time. And on the six-month day, we ask that you would watch over this young girl's life. Make her into a woman that you would have her to be. And now, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I dedicate you, Kara, Faith, Betcher, to the Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the fifth Sunday of the month, and on our fifth Sundays, we go right to the message. So if you'd join me in looking into God's Word, I'm going to be speaking from Deuteronomy chapter 5, and I'm going to start, or actually, I'm going to be speaking from verse 18. The title of the message is, Stay Faithful in Marriage. We are in the midst of the Ten Commandments, and we've looked at the Ten Commandments. Those have been, have no other gods before me. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Have no carved images. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Last week we talked about that, of how many of us in this room are like, well, we haven't done that at all. We've not murdered anyone, but have we murdered with our thoughts? Have we murdered with our tongues? And we need to be careful in that, not to murder anyone. Today we're going to talk about don't commit adultery and Maybe an interesting topic is we're on a fifth Sunday and our kids are in with us, and I'm glad that our kids are in with us today. But let me go back to the beginning. God created the earth in six days. He created light. He created seas. He created plants, animals. He created 
clouds. He created the heavens. He created the sun, the birds, the moon, the stars, all of creation, sea creatures to man. And man was his highest creation. All that was created, God saw as good. But when he made man, he gave man the authority to rule over all of the earth. In Genesis 2.18, it states that it wasn't good for man to be alone. And so he gave man a helper, and that helper was called a woman. Now, some have referred to a woman as a, whoa, man. But God made male and female. And though Adam and Eve didn't have an official ceremony like we would do today of a marriage ceremony, Genesis 2.24 states that they were one. Here's what it says. A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Ever since creation, there have been two genders, male and female, and they provide for one another. They provide for one another individually. They provide for one another reproduction, possibly, companionship, and enjoyment, and there will continue to be two genders forever. There, there is a number of things that have been created by God that have been used correctly and also abused. And marriage is one of those, something that God created to be kind and loving and valuable between one man and one woman has been so twisted and also out of whack. But God has given us a standard, and may we look to God's direction for our relationship. So I'm going to read this verse from Deuteronomy chapter 5. I'm going to be using other verses from the Scripture as well, but Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 18, will be on the screen behind me. If you didn't happen to bring a Bible, it's on page 150. Here's what God's Word tells us today. And you shall not commit adultery. The first thing I want you to do, see is this. We should strive for purity. The basic understanding of committing adultery is being intimate sexually with someone that is not your spouse. But it is more than just one act. When two people are intimate with one another, something more than just a physical act takes place. It tells us this in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. When a man and a woman come together, the Scripture tells us that instead of two, they become one. But it's more than just an act. It's a state of mind. It's a concentration on things. And you may be here today and you may say, well, I've never done that, so I'm I'm good. But God wants purity for us, and it's the best thing for us. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it says this, For all that is in the world, this version says the desires of the flesh. I, um, also, there's another version that says the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Jesus steps it up and says, hey, you need to be committed and committed to purity. If you remember last week when I was talking about do not murder, like, well, I haven't done that. But Jesus said, if you have anger in your heart, then you've murdered that individual. I've talked about murdering people with your tongue as well. What does Jesus say about this committing adultery? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30, Jesus addresses this. He says this, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. I did not bring uh, any razors or any cutting knives with me today, because I don't think that it's necessarily saying we should cut out our eyes. 
But we have to be careful. Men, we have to be careful with our gazes. We have to be careful with our eyes. What we fix our eyes on for long periods of time. Men are attracted visually. And men, we have to be careful with this. Women, you need to be careful as well. We need to fix our eyes and our emotions and our minds on our spouses. And all, whether we're married or not, need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Some would say, well, I haven't committed adultery, but there are some images that come in front of us, men and women. A lot of times, it's majority more, it's men. And it's happening on a phone or on the internet. We cannot do that. That's not right according to what God's Word says. Maybe a movie, maybe TV can be a trap. Seek godly eyesight. Women, a lot of times, are intrigued through emotions. Be careful who you share things with, ladies. Share with your husbands. I think women should share with their husband first on things. Not with their mom, not with a sister or brother or children or another woman. Have your husband be your first go-to. We we live in a culture that agrees, allows, and sometimes even promotes sexual activity and hooking up and living together. My fellow believers, that's not what Scripture tells us to do. Scripture says that when you have decided to be married to a woman and a woman decides to be married to a man, that they should remain pure and on their wedding day they come together and then they live together and then they live in holy matrimony with one another. Well, but it's, we're, we're good companions, but that's not what God's Word says. Well, it's going to save us money, but God's Word doesn't say that. God's Word says... Be honorable and be pure. Well, it fulfills a need within my being. Okay, (laughs) there's a lot of things. I'm hungry, so does that mean I just go pig out? Not necessarily. Please love your spouse and don't be involved with someone other than your spouse intimately because there are consequences that can come from this. The Old Testament uh, there were actually some extreme com- uh, uh, extreme deals that would happen with that. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Now again, <clears throat> if we look at this verse a little bit, some of you might say, well, it wasn't the wife of my neighbor. It was somebody. <laughs> Don't. If God is saying, don't have adultery with anybody, don't have adultery with anybody, in Hebrews 13, verse 4, it says, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Please hear me in this as well. I do not stand in front of you to condemn any of you, because I'm not the one that judges. This is what the Scripture says, as well as you should not either. If you know of someone around you that's not living right in your mind with morality, then you need to point them to Scripture, but don't judge them. God will judge them. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 3 4, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, we become sanctified here, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to control his own body and holiness and honor. The second thing I want you to see is this. God has ordained for marriage to be between one man and one woman. There's a number of you that are in this room that you have been and you continue to be faithful to your spouse. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the ways that, that our culture is crying out is saying, okay, if the church... Is a, if I should be living according to what the church has said, what does those people in that church believe and what do they live like? The truth is that a number of studies, there is as much divorce in the church as out of the church. Now, there's a number of different reasons. I'm not here to judge that today. I'm just saying we as a church 
not just First Wesleyan, but God's church, to be one that are faithful to one another. And many of you are. And I say thank you. And God says thank you. Because truth be told, there's a couple of marriages that are being represented here that have went through some very difficult things. It hasn't been easy. And there has probably been some times of, I have to forgive this guy? (laughs) I have to forgive this lady? Yes. And God rewards you. There's a number of you that have been very faithful, and I just applaud you and say, keep it up. Because there are individuals around you that wonder maybe how you do it. There's a number of you that have lost spouses, and you continue to be faithful and pure. God bless you for doing that. There's a growing misunderstanding of our physical bodies and the connection we have with them. God, since the creation of the world, made male and female. There are two distinct genders, and they respond differently. And God created an attraction to happen between a male and a female. And a female to a male. It's normal. It's how God created us. God's Word talks about other interests. If you want to go with me to Romans chapter 1. It tells us about what was happening at that point in time, and there's nothing new under the sun. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped this creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, verse 26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shapeless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. God has called us, me, you, believers, to a higher standard. The Ten Commandments, as a reminder, are for believers, for us, for you, for me. And I have seen a number of people, and so have you. Well, I'm going to go my own way. And many of those are not in a loving loving relationship with the Lord, and that burdens me. I was a youth pastor for a number of years, and and several of those teens have said, well, I'm going to do my way. I just want to remind you that males are attracted to to females, not males attracted to males, males attracted to females, and females attracted to males. I know there's a number of parents in the room today, and so when your your child comes to you and says, maybe you have a daughter, and she says, I really like this boy, that's a good thing. That's okay. That's, That's how God wired and when your son comes to you and says, oh, I think there's a girl that I kind of like. What do I do, Dad? What do I do, Mom? You work within that framework and say, God has a design for marriage for you. You stay pure. But that's okay because that's the way God wired us. The third thing I want you to see is this. Temptations are all around us. And we can stand strong. Just like in the days of old, temptations are around us. Have you read the Old Testament? There's a couple cities by the name of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you know why they were destroyed? Because of homosexuality. You know about David and Bathsheba? David and Bathsheba. David was up on the on his little wherever in his in his uh, in his palace and looking down. Hey, whoa, and. And he had some indecent acts with her. And then her husband was killed because of all of that. In Judges 19, it talks about rape. There is a, an interesting couple named Samson and Delilah. Hmm. Noah became drunk, and when he became drunk, do you know what happened there? See, it's, <clears throat> it's nothing new. And sometimes we have a bad day, and we become disillusioned. And we get fearful and we get intrigued by something and we find ourselves being tempted. And the enemy seeks whom he can devour. And that's all of us because we 
aim to live for the Lord. And one way he does it is by breaking up marriages and families. And may you and I stand strong against this temptation. The fourth thing I want you to hear is this. Cling to your spouse, not to someone else. So there was a time in, in my uh, relationship with Manel that uh, this is before we were married. Manel's my wife, if you don't know her. Uh, she was in first service. Um, that we weren't necessarily dating, I don't think, at the time, but we went to the Omaha Zoo together. And uh, she thought about leaving me with the monkeys, but she did not, and I'm thankful for that. But we hadn't uh, had a DTR yet, a define the relationship deal, and, and, uh, but I was attracted to her, and I think she was attracted to me, um, I think anyway. And you know how uh, it was, maybe some of you who remember back in the days, and it's a couple of years ago for many of you, that you kind of got close to that person. And, and I remember walking beside her and, and kind of brushing hands at one point in time. Oh, yeah, that's kind of fun because maybe I get to hold her hand, you know, and, and not just a hold a hand like this, but a hold hand like this, right? Because that doesn't mean as much as this. Well, anyway, um, but you know what? Um, we eventually held hands and, you know, hugged and other things as well along the way. But, um, you know, some of those initial touches like that have kind of gone away. I mean, as I look around the room at some of you who are married um, in the room, um, there's an arm or two around everybody, but you're probably not holding hands like this because, eh, you know, that was so many years ago, 5, 10, 15 50 years. Now, some of you that have been married, you still like to hold hands, and that's okay. But I need to touch Manel, and she needs to touch me, and we need to continue to have physical touch in our relationship. Husbands, keep your love alive for your wives. Wives, may you keep your love alive for your, for, for your husbands. There may be someone who catches your eye, but don't let that person catch your heart. May your spouse be the one that you look to. And God clings to us and helps us. Lives in our church and lives in the church have been affected by infidelity. And I will pray against that for myself. And I will pray against that for you as well. And you pray for that for others that are around our church. Why? Because the enemy wants to come in and defy it in any part of the church. May each of us as men and women and children stand strong. Now, may I talk to the children and the teens and the young adults for just a couple of moments. There is a huge pressure in our society to live freely in the culture and do what you want. May I promise you May I promise you that if you get involved in adultery, there will be a lot of heartache, despair, and all kinds of frustrations that could come your way. The society says it's all fun and there's no big deal. But may I embolden you to stand strong against cultural pressure and stand up for what is right in this sex-crazed culture. Look to a number of people in our church that have remained faithful in holy matrimony between one man and one woman. And I promise you, I don't promise you actually, God's Word promises you, and I just happen to be the messenger. If you are faithful and you are pure, that that's the best life that you can have. And you as a young lady, as you stand in a marriage ceremony some way, someday with a man, if you are a lady that stands in purity, Wow, there's nothing better than that. And you as a man, that if you stand with a young lady in purity at your marriage ceremony, there is nothing better than that. And I want to remind you of this as well. This could be for teens. It could be for any adult that's here. Forgiveness can happen. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we, for, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there's been something in your heart, in your mind, in your life, repent of that and God can forgive that. But I want to share a different twist on how this view, this verse might be viewed just a little differently. 
We are the body of Christ. We are the body of believers. The church is a body. But there are some marriage words between Christ and the church. God gives us a covenant. If you look back in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it's actually right here in verses 2 and 3. Here's what it says. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. There is a covenant and a marriage covenant concept that happens between the church and Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth, he is called. Why is this important to God? He knows the importance of our lives, but He also knows there is a time that is called the marriage supper of the land, Lamb that is coming. This is the time when the bride of Christ, which would be the body of Christ, which would be the church, meets up with Jesus at the end time. Some will say that the bride is Israel and may be true, but I believe that all of us are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He invites us all into a covenant. Each one of us, regardless of where, whether we're married in this life or not, and he uses this, this covenant or use like a marriage with us to keep us ready for the wedding. How do we know? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, which we kind of focus on at times, but hear the next part. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. See, Christ loves the church. And our understanding of a wedding ceremony has changed since this was written. There was a procedure that would happen where the bride and the groom would come together and and they would agree to get married. But then the bride went away and the groom went away. And there was a time of, if you will, engagement. I understand that maybe they didn't see a whole lot of each other during that time. For us, now you continue on with life and you say, we're going to get engaged and I still get to talk to that individual. But they didn't get to do that. And I ask, are we ready for the groom for Jesus to return? We sing the song, even so come. And the words in it say, like a bride waiting for her groom will be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing. The bride anticipates the groom coming, and come the groom, he will come, Jesus will come. Think, think on this for a moment. Uh, um, uh, I've never been a female, and I will never be a female, and I never was a bride, uh, though I was a groom. <clears throat> but I've been told that a lot of young ladies look forward to their wedding day. And as a little girl, they think about their wedding day, and they just dream about the wedding day. And then finally that wedding day comes. They're dressed in the best that they can be dressed in. They fix their hair for hours. <laughs> they worry about their nail. Why? Because they're waiting for the groom. The groom comes up front, and there's something that happens between about there and about here that sometimes just gets the emotions and people involved. You know, I don't know if you remember that or not, but something happens. Why? Because... I'm coming down the aisle for my groom. In the same way, that's what Christ is waiting for, the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 9, it says, Let us rejoice and exalt and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's you. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Jesus is going to be coming back. And as people, we want to present ourselves as the bride, spotless and ready for Jesus' return. Not just individually, but together as a body of believers. How does this relate? I desire to be faithful to my wedding vows. And I believe that each of you are married here desire that as well. But we as believers, all of us, whether you're married or not, are asked to be ready for the Lord and faithful to the Lord as well. Think on this. Um, I was engaged in February of 2001, 
and I was married in August of 2001. And uh, I actually lived in Sioux Falls, and Manel lived in Lincoln at the time, so we didn't see each other every day. But imagine if um, when we got engaged on February, that in March I called Manel and I said, oh, by the way, I, <laughs> I went on four dates uh, in, in the last three weeks with some pretty neat ladies. What do you think Manel would have thought of that? <laughs> I wouldn't be here today, <laughs> would I? Or what would have happened if April of that year, I would have said, hey, Manel, how are things today? Great. Today at lunch, I met this guy. Oh, he's a nice guy. And we spent two and a half hours talking over lunch. I couldn't believe what happened to the time. It was just so wonderful. What do you think I would have done at that point in time? Click. <laughs> and we do that to the Lord. We put other gods before God. And he's invited us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Manel didn't do that, and I didn't do that. And I pray that there, nothing comes between our marriage relationship. But we're invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And yet we go off on this fancy, and we go off on this fancy, and we go to this God, and we go on this mindset for a while. Would you be willing to see your relationship with God a little deeper and desire all of your life to be the Lord's, we as a church, not just First Wesleyan, but we as a church, want to prepare ourselves for that marriage supper. And that's why we need to be ready for the Lord's coming. And so when you read this and it says, you shall not commit adultery, you may say, that didn't apply to me. Even if you're married or not, I ask the question, how are you doing in your relationship with the Lord? The fifth thing is this, if you are not married, uh, stay pure. If you're not married, plan to stay pure. If you are married, stay pure. Stay faithful. Be committed. Keep your eyes on Christ. If you're married, commit your spouse once again. Commit yourself to your spouse once again today. If you are unmarried, whether you're old, you're young, or in between, be pure of mind. I'm going to pray for every person here today. I know it's a weighty subject, but it's true, and it's going to be true for all of time. And let me remind you, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May God Almighty encourage you this morning in your marriage vows or for your vows when you go home to be with the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for my parents. I thank you for my mom and my dad and, and Manel's mom and dad who have and continue to remain faithful. It hasn't been the easiest for I, any of them, but they've remained faithful. Thank you for the, the way they show us how to remain married and faithful. God, I thank you for my wife and I thank you for all of the wives and the husbands that are represented here. I pray, God, right now that you would protect every marriage that's here, every man, every woman, every husband, every wife. I pray that you would put your hedge of protection around these marriages. The enemy wants to break up marriages and break up families, and I just pray against that. I pray that you would help that man or that woman that is wanting to stray or go away. I pray that they would cling to their spouse. I pray that you would help us to forgive one another and lift one another up and encourage one another instead of tearing down. God, I thank you for the marriages that are in this room that serve as a great example to an outside world that's saying, how in the world do you do this? And they're not even, some of those not even married. Some of those are, are living together at this point in time. And they say, how do you do it? And, and we can point others to you and what you're doing in our lives. And so, God, I pray I had your protection around every marriage that is being represented here today. God, I pray that you would be with some marriages that we know about that are, that are facing very difficult times, relationships that are very difficult. I, I pray, God, that you would help husbands and wives not to stray, but that they would cling yet once again. And we pray for that in the power of Jesus' name. God, I pray for every child, every teen, and every young adult in this culture that says, do whatever you want. I pray, God, that they would stand strong for you 
and they would put the boundaries up and they would say yes to you and that God, you would do a mighty work in and through their lives and you would keep them pure, keep them purity in their mind and in their actions. And then someday when they stand at a wedding altar somewhere, someplace, whether it be outside or in a church building, they would say, I am pure and so is my spouse. Oh God, I pray for that. I pray, God, that you would be with somebody here this morning who just needs to, in the quietness of this moment, say, God, would you please forgive me for whatever? And I pray that you would help them to know of your forgiving power. And may they walk in that, knowing that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed the transgression from them. And God, I pray for each one of us that we would be ready and we would not be adulterous with any other thing in this world, but that you would prepare us for the marriage supper of the Lamb, May we come, may we be spotless on that day that you call us home, and may we look forward to that marriage supper of the Lamb, and may we say, even so, come. Thank you, God, for allowing us the ability to resist temptation, and may we be strong for you. May you give us the strength. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into the children's uh, sermon today, I'd like to go through a few announcements. Just a reminder that there is an attendance record in one of the chairs in front of you. Just filled this out and place it in the sanctuary on your way out today. We would appreciate that. And if you're a first-time guest, thanks for being here today. We're glad that you could join us. We just ask that you would fill this out, hold on to it, and turn it into the information desk right outside the commons area. And because there is a, a this is a fifth Sunday, there is... No Sunday school today, so just a reminder of that, that um, your uh, family should be with you. And so um, uh, we're glad that we can worship together as a family today. On February 12th, there is a ladies' event that will be happening, and it is called Heart Prints. If you're a lady in the room, I encourage you to sign up. Um, there is a sign-up sh- uh, table right outside the sanctuary, and even invite a friend. And then next Sunday, February 6th, there is a missions conference meeting happening in room 112 after second service in this um, classroom right over to the left, your right of mine. At this time, can I get all the children to come up fifth and under, fifth grade and under to come up here and just sit right in this area here? Yeah, come on up. Let's go ahead and sit right here. There we are. Good, good, good. Good crew this morning. Oh, try to sit on the floor over here. Let's sit on the floor. Sit on the floor. Can you sit on the floor here? All righty. Grab this here. How's everyone doing this morning? Good? Kind of quiet. The first group was ready to go. Are you you awake? No? No? Oh, you guys can walk pretty good. Well, great. Well, thanks for coming up here. And do you do you know what Pastor Steve's been teaching on? Yeah, that's right, the Ten Commandments. And these are commandments or instructions from God to which we are to live our lives out as, right? This is how we're supposed to live our lives as by following the Ten Commandments, and that's a good thing. And God calls us to be faithful to them. And so I have a question for you. What does the word faithful mean? Do you know? No? Okay, that's good. Well, to have faith, yes, yes. Same thing? Yeah, to have trust, yeah. You got one more? Yeah, we can have faith as Jesus is coming back. Yep, yep, yep. If When you hear the word faithful, think of this idea of being loyal or trustworthy or doing what you're supposed to do, right? 
And so right behind me here, I have a car, okay? This is no special car. It's a Hot Wheels car. And for this car to work properly, everything on this car has to be trustworthy or faithful, right? For it to roll around like that, right? It goes back and forth nice. It's, yeah, you could do some, like, car noises and everything, right? I, I won't do that. Uh, I'm probably not as good as you guys. Um, but for it to work, it needs every part. The wheels need to be faithful. And if this is a real car, the driver needs to be, the steering wheel needs to work, and everything. Those parts need to be trustworthy, right? You, like, roll them down there? Yeah. They're, cars are fun to play with. What were to happen if this lost a wheel? Would it drive the same as it would before if it had four wheels? Are you sure? You're positive on that. But would it drive like it would before if it had four wheels? No, of course not. Yeah, it would not roll, right? Can you imagine a real car going down the street and it loses a wheel while it's driving? Yeah, we don't want that to happen. Would that be good? No, an accident would happen, right? So this idea that we are called to be faithful is like is for us to follow God's commands. Because when we follow God's commands... We are doing what we were created to do, right? Just like as this tire works properly, as this tire is trustworthy and faithful, and it's not going to fall off, this car is going to roll like it's created to do, right? So I want to read you guys a verse out of the book of Hebrews, and it's actually Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. All right. Can you help me with this? I, I'm going to need your help here real quick, okay? Say, by faith. You say, by faith. All right. Now, when I, say, when I say a word, I want you to repeat it, okay? I'll let you know which word it is, okay? All right. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was found because God had not taken him. Now, before he was taken... He was commending as having please God. Can you say please God? And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he, that he rewards those who seek him. See, when we are faithful, that makes God happy. Can you say that with me? When we are faithful... That makes God happy. Just like this car, right? When it's faithful, it's created what we're supposed to do. When we are faithful to God, we make God happy, for that's what God created us to do. So I have some cars here, and I would just like to hand some out here for a second. So give me a moment.
All righty. So these cars are yours to keep, okay? Can you do me a favor? Every time, hold on, hold on. Let's not play with them. Hold on real quick, okay? Every time that you see a car, you see a Hot Wheels car, you see a car out there, think about how all the elements of that car are all the ways that car has to be faithful for it to work. And then I want you to remember this, that God is happy when we are faithful to him. All right, let's pray, and then you can go back to your seats, okay? All right. Heavenly Father, oh, let's pray, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. We thank you that we could learn from your word today about being faithful. God, we love you so much, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and go back to your seats. Oh, she that that's all right. She she doesn't know how to play with a car quite yet, there, buddy. And at this time, Brett Poppin is coming up and he is going to lead us in prayer. As we go into a time of prayer this morning, I invite you to find the posture that's appropriate for you. And please know that the altars are open. Please hear these words from Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Heavenly Father, your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your voice thunders with power and is full of majesty. With your eyes, O oh God, you search the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to you. Your ears are toward their cry. You uphold us with your righteous right hand. With an outstretched arm, you redeem us. You are clothed with awesome majesty. Splendor and majesty are ever before you. Heaven is your throne and the earth your footstool. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Father, our spirits soar to ever new heights when we ponder your glory, when our gaze is upon your ways, when your promises are the treasures of our heart, and when we worship you in the spirit and truth. In those moments, O oh Lord, we begin to get a glimpse of what it means that in you we may have life and have it abundantly. But how often we come crashing down again. Our thoughts descend to the cares of the world. Our gaze falls upon selfish desires. Our wandering hearts delight in worthless things. Please be merciful to us, O God. Be merciful to us. Give us steadfast hearts. With thanksgiving, we proclaim your promise. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Father God, as we continue to seek you in prayer, there are many concerns, needs, and longings of the heart that we desire to bring before you. But first, in this moment, in this time you have given us to worship you corporately, we seek out your will. We pray that your will would be done in this body, in this community, in this country, and to the ends of the earth. And we ask, O oh God, that you would fulfill your purpose for each individual here. God, we thank you for the work of Cornerstone Women's Shelter. Please minister to the needs of all it serves. We thank you for our sister church, Redfield Wesleyan, and Pastor Adrian Timmons in Redfield, South Dakota. Please let them sense your presence as they worship you this morning. God, we intercede for those in the midst of storms of destruction. You know the various forms in which those storms are raging. We lift up to you those afflicted with sickness, those suffering from physical ailments, those hurting from broken relationships, 
those grieving from the loss of loved ones. Specifically, we pray for the Johnson family, the Studioso family, and the Gardner family, as each have lost loved ones over the course of recent days. Please pour out your comfort and peace upon them. Father God, until these storms pass by, we ask that for each individual, you would be a strong and mighty refuge, that you would gather each in the shadow of your wings, that each soul would experience your steadfast love, your comfort, and your peace that surpasses all understanding, and that each would draw renewed strength and encouragement from your faithfulness. We thank you, God, for the awesome privilege of worshiping you here together this morning. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of our souls. Amen. Thank you, Brett. As the worship team is coming forward, uh, just a few things that I would like to mention. One of those things is that Morgan and Brittany Wainwright are uh, over here, and uh, Owen, their youngest son, was born this past Saturday. So welcome, Owen. We just wanted to uh, recognize you guys. <laughs> Thanks for being here. The other thing uh, that I'll make mention of is the second song that we're going to sing uh, this morning is, Oh, Be Careful, Little Eyes. And maybe you uh, have sung it in Sunday school or sung it with maybe even your children uh, but it might seem kind of elementary to some of us as adults to be singing this children's song, but I think it goes really well with what Pastor Steve preached on. And any time we talk about being faithful, we have to be careful what our eyes see, and we have to be careful what our ears hear, and we have to be careful what our hands do and where our feet go. So let's stand together and continue to glorify the name of our Father. God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. The purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moments from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. the 
Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done, and give Him the glory.
God's name, being faithful and committed to him, you are sent out.